uh, I would like to introduce our next panel. Uh, this esteemed group is comprised of senior executives of Spanish multinational companies that are truly are ahead of the game. They will share some insights to their pathways to success, which highlights not only their accomplishment, but also some challenges that they face along the way. Hosting this panel discussion, uh, I will have, um, we will have Mauro Guillén, Professor of International Management and Director of the Joseph Lauder Institute of Management and International Studies at Wharton School, Director also of the, Le Pen, of the Penn Lauder Center for International Business Education and Research. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to begin by thanking the organizing committee and uh, also by telling you that uh, uh, we're about to uh, share with you very good news about uh, not just uh, the present predicament of the Spanish economy, but also the future. Uh, because the good news comes from the corporate sector, from the companies that are represented on this panel. And uh, believe me, uh, these are just uh, five companies among many uh, in uh, Spain. Uh, that are doing very well, uh, that have the uh, ability to compete on a worldwide basis and that are essentially uh, proving or demonstrating uh, that the uh, Spanish economy is a uh, perfect launching pad uh, for doing business uh, around the world. Uh, the panel discussion is about the uh, global competitiveness of uh, different kinds of industries. We chose a company uh, to represent uh, each of uh, five uh, parts of the, uh, of the Spanish economy. Uh, and as you know, of course, uh, Spain uh, is uh, much more than the cliches and the stereotypes uh, that a lot of people uh, believe uh, characterize the country. Uh, very few people know that Spain is a major export power and that uh, it doesn't uh, export just uh, tourism. Uh, it also exports automobiles, machine tools, uh, electrical machinery, and all manner of consumer goods. As Mayor Blomberg uh, mentioned, uh, that includes also um, aeronautical equipment and uh, components. Uh, and Spanish firms are also major foreign investors. We don't just export. Our companies also have major investments outside of Spain. And actually, Spain is one of the top 10 uh, foreign investment countries uh, in the world. And the, uh, the companies represented on this panel are just uh, uh, a few of the uh, more than 3,000 companies in Spain that have major investments outside of the, uh, of the country. Uh, so I would like to uh, first uh, introduce uh, Carlos Espinosa de los Monteros. I will actually introduce each of the speakers uh, very briefly because you have their full biographies in the program. Carlos Espinosa de los Monteros has a Lompe degree uh, in uh, the Spanish business sector and also in the government. Uh, he has been the CEO, top executive or board member of uh, several important uh, Spanish companies. Uh, but he is here today with us in his quality as a high commissioner of the government for Brand Spain, for Marca España. And I would like to ask him first uh, the very basic question for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with this effort. What is Marca España? What is uh, Brand Spain? <coughs> well, I, I hope this uh, works and can you hear? Okay, uh, Marca España or Brand Spain is mainly an effort of uh, putting together what has been done in the past uh, to promote the image uh, of Spain, both from private and public sector, trying to increase the awareness of uh, what Spain has to offer today in, in many fields. Spain is known, as uh, Mauro was saying, by uh, tourism, but we are becoming uh, a powerful industrial power. In recent years, uh, we have doubled the exports uh, of Spain abroad in the last uh, four years. Uh, last two years, uh, we gained share in the international market, so international trade grew below the growth uh, of the Spanish exports. And all this is something new, which is not so well known abroad, and our main task is trying to promote the awareness of this. Yes, yeah, so, so Carlos, I think you are absolutely correct in saying uh, that what's important is to focus the attention on what products and services are competitive in an economy. Paul Krugman, before he became a pundit, uh, wrote very interesting papers uh, arguing that economies don't compete. Economies can be characterized by the degree of competitiveness, but it's actually companies that compete with products and services. Okay. So you have to name three categories of products or services in Spain that you think are especially competitive at this point in time. Which ones would you choose? Well, if I had to choose uh, three, which are not so well known, I would choose infrastructure, uh, which is a broad uh, sector, including the construction of, uh, of roads, uh, energy plants, uh, 
all kinds of big infra infrastructure. We have six companies among the top 10 in the world, so we are very competitive in, in that sector. Uh, a second choice could be the renewable energies, in which both in uh, wind energy and solar energy and thermal solar energy, Spain has become uh, one of the three leading countries in the world, and we have a strong presence already in the U.S. And if I had to, to choose a third one, I could talk about uh, everything concerning the style of life, which goes uh, from food, wine, fashion, all this uh, uh, furniture, design, all this that makes uh, life uh, more agreeable to everybody. Um, and uh, of course, Marca España or uh, Brand Spain is not only about uh, the, the uh, foreign projection, the international projection of Spanish companies. It's also about attracting uh, investments to, uh, to Spain. Uh, so in the current situation, uh, so we've heard before that, of course, the economy is undergoing a process uh, of uh, restructuring. Uh, what do you think are the main attractions uh, of Spain as a location to do business for potential foreign investors, especially U.S. or American investors? Well, Mayor Bloomberg was uh, talking before about New York being a gateway uh, to America. Uh, Spain, in some ways, is a gateway both uh, to Europe, to Latin America, and to Northern Africa. So this is an asset uh, we have. And second asset is that we have a very big, uh, strong, well-educated population that uh, makes attractive and easy to, to find the necessary people when you project an investment. And the third one would be that has been a labor reform that has made much more attractive to invest in Spain for industrial companies. As a matter of fact, last year, 2012, despite all the bad economic news, Spain was the first country in Europe to attract industrial investments. And among those industrial investments, we had several American companies, some in the automotive industry. We had uh, received uh, important uh, investments from both uh, Ford Motor Company and, and GM but also in the pharmaceutical industry and also in the, this uh, Las Vegas uh, big investment uh, uh, of uh, Las Vegas Sands. So altogether made Spain the, the number one in, in attracting uh, industrial uh, um, companies uh, to, uh, in Europe. And I think this is going to continue uh, this year. And maybe those are some of the assets uh, we have. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. So I would thank like you. now to turn to uh, one of the companies represented on the panel, which is Repsol. And we have here with us today Arturo Gonzalo, who is the uh, Corporate Director of Institutional Relations and Corporate Responsibility at Repsol. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Spanish oil industry, Repsol happens to be one of the largest uh, oil companies in the world, and it has a presence around the world. So my first uh, question for you is actually uh, for those uh, in the audience who are not familiar with your company. What is uh, uh, Repsol's uh, stature in the uh, global oil industry? Could you give us like uh, two or three uh, key facts about uh, uh, Repsol's global presence? Thank you, Mauro. Thank you. Well, we are one of the five largest oil and gas companies in Europe. We are in all the life cycle of the oil and gas industry. We explore and pr produce oil and gas. Uh, we are in something like 30 countries. And we also refine and market oil and petroleum products in different countries. We are in very interesting places in the world, like Libya or Venezuela or, or Bolivia or others. So uh, you won't be surprised if I tell you that lately we've been increasing our operations in OECD countries and very significantly in the US and Canada. We started our operations in the US in 2006. We took a stake in San Seafield. It's a very big and promising oil field in the Gulf of Mexico. And afterwards, we have uh, increased our positions in Alaska we are now exploring in the north slope of Alaska, and we are also in Louisiana and in the Mississippian basin of unconventional oil and gas in Kansas and Oklahoma. We have headquarters in Houston. We have 400 people there now. Our geophysics 
International Division is based in Houston. And we are building new headquarters, and our workforce is going to increase as much as 750 people in the coming years. We have 445 blocks in the US, and we are investing <coughs> over $1 billion a year. And we have already more than $6 billion invested in the country. We are also very active in, in the offshore Canada, in Newfoundland, Labrador, and other places. So we are trying to become a very active actor in the U.S. Yeah, so you, when you mention the U.S. market these days in oil and gas, it's uh, uh, impossible to avoid a, uh, you know, the topic of uh, shale gas and shale uh, uh, oil formations. Uh, and uh, of course, we've all been reading in the press that the U.S. could become at some point in the near future, a net exporter of oil, which is something that I, I, I never imagined I would actually witness in my lifetime. Uh, so what uh, role is Repsol planning to, uh, to play in the uh, coming North American shale, gas, and oil boom? Well, uh, definitely this is an unexpected revolution. I think nobody could have said 10 years ago what was going to happen in the shale, gas, and oil industry in the US. But this is going to, sh to change completely the game in, in several respects. First, as you mentioned, it is expected that the US may be independent, energy independent, in two decades. <coughs> as early as 2020, the US may become a net gas exporter. This is happening at the same time that in China or India or the European Union, the external energy dependency is growing and growing. So this has very substantial geopolitical implications for the future. What does it mean that the US becomes energy independent? What does it mean towards Middle East or <coughs> other places? So this is a revolution in the energy, in the geopolitical scene, and we are trying to be part of that game as well. And as I mentioned, we have started operations through an alliance with Sandbridge Company. And we are now in the Mississippi Lime Basin. It's a very promising light oil uh, basin. And we, we, we are operating through this, this alliance, yes, as I mentioned, in Oklahoma and Kansas. Can this happen in other places in the world? It could, but it doesn't seem easy. Uh, for instance, perhaps in India or in Russia, China, there is an opportunity. But in other places, or else there aren't the resources there, like in Europe, which is not clear that we have significant resources, nor the political will to develop these resources. <coughs> or there are other countries, for instance, like Argentina, which potentially has the resources, but perhaps the conditions are not. So, yeah. Now quite. that you mention Argentina, of course, I cannot resist uh, the temptation of uh, asking a, a very obvious question, which is, uh, in your industry, how important is it for the legal framework to provide with uh, strong investor protections? It's an absolutely key aspect of the game. According to the Energy Information Administration of the US, Argentina could have as much as the third world reserves of unconventional oil and gas. As a matter of fact, when Repsol managed YPF in 2010, we announced a major discovery, the Vaca Muerta field. In February 2012, two months prior to the confiscation of YPF by the Argentine government, we presented an assessment by Ryder Scott of the reserves in Vaca Muerta. And only in 40% of, of YPF's concessions in Vaca Muerta, there were 23.8 billion barrels of oil of reserves. And we announced that we had uh, 15 MOUs with international companies that could bring $4 billion immediately to start developing these assets. Uh, then the confiscation arrived in April last year. And since then, uh, all the efforts of the Argentine government to attract the $37 billion that are needed to start a viable operation in Vaca Muerta in five years have been unsuc unsuccessful. This is because ours is a capital intensive business 
and with very long-term investments, and you need to be sure that the host government is going to comply with the rules of the game. In Argentina, that hasn't happened, and we are sure that uh, if there isn't a fair compensation to Repsol for YPF assets, this is not going to happen. Okay. So from oil, uh, let's now turn to uh, technology. And of course, we're here in the uh, arguably the most uh, technologically advanced uh, country in the, uh, in the world. And we have here with us Juan González, uh, who is the um, leader for strategic development at Indra. And uh, the first question for you, Juan, would be the following. Uh, so not just from the vantage point of Indra, but rather, uh, you know, more generally, uh, high-tech companies in Spain. What do you think are the two or three most important um, opportunities in the U.S. market uh, right now? Um, I, I'd rather speak from the point of view of Indra, because taking uh, 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 the voice of every other company is difficult. But I'll, I'll build on a point that was made before, which is... Uh, Spain is good at infrastructures, and we think at Indra that uh, infrastructures are more valuable when technology is added on top of them. Uh, so, uh, so when there's this idea of smart infrastructure, uh, the idea not only that, that you develop uh, the, the asset, but uh, you put the technology that allows uh, the owner of the or, or the operator of the asset to to leverage those assets more more effectively, uh, and uh, that is an area where. Um, it's a great opportunity here in the United States, uh, and when you think about very broadly of what infrastructure is, there's of course uh, transport infrastructure, uh, there's uh, all sorts of, of uh, um, analysis on the need to improve uh, the, uh, the road and, uh, and the uh, transportation and the uh, rail uh, assets in the country, and that is done by physical assets, but also by uh, a smart use of, of technology that, and that allows for those uh, intelligent transportation systems to be, uh, to be developed and, and run, be it in tolling systems for traffic, traffic congestion and the like, be it for high-speed train, be it for not so high-speed train, it depends on, on the, there's a long discussion on what is high-speed and how it should work, uh, and also even for, for uh, air traffic control, where uh, Indra is one of the leading players in the world. We are not in the U.S. market, but uh, we'd like to be definitely in the U.S. air traffic control market. That is one, one part of infrastructure, which then leads to this concept of uh, smart cities. Uh, people tend to live more and more in, in cities, and uh, uh, getting the right infrastructure uh, to work in cities, transportation systems, security systems, uh, the whole thing. Uh, that's another area where, where uh, Indra, in particular, and other Spanish companies could work, but Indra has uh, set eyes on, on the idea. Uh, we have a third type of inf infrastructure w which we look at carefully and we have high hopes, which is all the um, healthcare providing uh, infrastructure. Uh, healthcare is uh, moving fast from a care, a human touch type of thing to a much more technology driven business with significant investments at every layer. Not only what we think about uh, big hospitals and, and big uh, care uh, providing centers, but rather uh, your own home becomes uh, an extension of, of the healthcare providing infrastructure, provided the uh, sensors and the communications and the uh, technology to, to be able to monitor and deliver uh, coverage and care. So healthcare is also another part of, of which, which uh, to us is, is very significant. And uh, the, the last area where we are working, and we think there's good opportunities for technology uh, with this concept of infrastructure is, is security. Uh, so being able to have um, continuous monitoring uh, of what is going on, things like uh, what happened in, which was in the news this morning of, of these guys going into ATMs and p taking money out of ATMs, uh, that can be prevented. Uh, and I hope none of you was uh, part, because it's been told that none of us lost money in the, in the process, but I can't believe that $24 billion or something that was mentioned came out of nowhere. Uh, so. Taking care of those things is also part of the ideas that we could be working on. Okay. And uh, when Indra um, uh, uh, tries to uh, take advantage of all of these opportunities in the U.S. market, uh, could you uh, share with us uh, you know, a couple of uh, points about how exactly do you, um, you know, gain a foothold here? Uh, what, is, what is the way to uh, you know, enter this market uh, like the United States? How, how do you actually you know, become a, a successful uh, tech company? in the areas that you mentioned in the U.S. market? 
Um, well, first, you mentioned it. Uh, the US market is, is the biggest market in the world for any technology you, you look at, but also the most competitive. Um, so uh, Indra is a 3 billion euro company, uh, 4 billion dollars, depending on the exchange rate, roughly. Uh, we compete here with the, the, the biggest, the strongest, the loudest, the hairiest uh, companies. So uh, knowing ourselves and knowing them, it would be absurd to go head to head or just uh, go uh, trying to, to outcompete them in their own market. So we, what we're trying to do is understanding very well what are the uh, opportunities at the margin. Uh, an opportunity at the margin in a market such as the United States in any other market in the world is a huge opportunity. So what we're trying to do is uh, trying to get our uh, position, strong position, in, in areas of, such as transportation, where, where it is a much more fragmented market, where uh, you can get into uh, smaller contracts, which allow us to build a position. We are working uh, with, uh, with healthcare, uh, in the healthcare industry, trying to establish a position with healthcare providers, uh, showing them that we are not in competition with other players, but providing an alternative to what they, they already have. Uh, we are uh, building uh, a position also around uh, other uh, companies, Spanish companies that have come to Spain with whom we have a strong relationship in the past and with whom we, we, we expect to extend our relationship in, in, in their operations here. So we are, every time we read that, that uh, one of our clients uh, is able to, to crack the US market, we are happy because we believe there's a chance for us to go with them and grow. Mm -hmm. Now Indra is uh, one of uh, many Spanish companies uh, that has established itself in Latin America yeah. before entering the U.S. market. That's not always the case, but it is certainly the case uh, for several of the companies represented here, and uh, it is uh, the, uh, the case for Indra. So in what ways does an established presence in Latin America <coughs> help a Spanish company then crack the U.S. market? Um, uh, it, 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 works, it works two ways. Um, uh, first of all, uh, with this idea that, that when, when, when our customers, uh, when our clients grow, we grow with them, uh, there's a significant growth of Latin American companies uh, that are entering the, uh, the North American market. So there's a, this idea that uh, multi-Latinas, uh, companies that, that from Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, are growing into, into powerhouses uh, and they are uh, aiming to, to enter the United States, we, we, are, we are working with them. Uh, and that is, that is good for us. We, we, were, we made a significant investment in, in Latin America, which now represents uh, roughly one third of our revenues, uh, give or take. Uh, things going as they go, uh, Latin America as a region could be our largest uh, single market uh, in, the, in the coming uh, few years. And Brazil and Mexico will become uh, very significant markets for us. So from a strong presence in Brazil and in Mexico, we are able to come with, with companies such as, say, Petrobras or uh, these type of names when, when they come to the United States and, and we work with them or the large uh, Brazilian construction companies. We are seeing also a reverse uh, uh, move now that, that our presence in, in Latin America is well known. We are leaders in several of the markets and overall we are the number one or number two company in the region. Um, when North American companies think of delivering services to Latin America and they want to technology and services providers such as we are, uh, they are turning to us to, to be able to provide them with a one-stop shop for their technology and, uh, and services needs in all regions and all countries in Latin America. So we see this dual way of from uh, getting with our customers from Latin America to here and then providing US companies a solution for their Latin American needs, which is, we think, working quite successfully. So thank you, Juan. So now I would like to uh, turn to a uh, topic that uh, Mayor Bloomberg also raised, which is the importance of the tourism industry. I mean, he mentioned that uh, New York receives uh, more than 50 million tourists every uh, year. And of course, that's a major source of income uh, for the city. And uh, that is also, as uh, we all know, uh, the case for, for Spain. So we have here with us today Jose Luis Toreda, who is the CEO of Excel Tour. Uh, which is the uh, 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 business association for the uh, companies uh, that are active in the tourism sector of Spain, and he previously worked for the World Trade. I'm sorry, for the World Tourism Organization, uh, so he knows the uh, industry very, very well on a worldwide basis. 
Uh, so I guess uh, the first question is pretty basic, but I think it's important to establish uh, the importance of the tourism sector uh, for the Spanish economy. So the question is, uh, from the point of view of our balance of payments, so our relationship with the rest of the world, uh, how would you characterize the, uh, the importance, the relevance of the uh, tourism sector? Well, let me go one step backwards. You want, I mean, we, <clears throat> we want to be called that we are the major driver of the Spanish economy, even though we're not so recognized and we're not maybe so techy and so glamorous as some other industries. But I think that the cause of our success during the last three decades has also been the success of a number of companies that have provided the necessary services for our success. So I think it's a win-win situation. And uh, if you allow me that first introduction, not just the cause that we receive many million tourists that we do, 57 million tourists, foreign tourists last year, which that accounts to over $80 billion uh, in terms of foreign receipts, which accounts of uh, around a 74% coverage of our deficit of the current account of our balance of payments. So we definitely can call ourselves that we are the best protective sector in order to encourage that the country risk premium or spread lowers down as much as we still keep looking that this year is going to be favorable in terms of foreign receipts, foreign income, even though our also very important insight or internal side of the business is not as blooming and is not as, um, let's say, confident as we are confident from the foreign side. So in summary, we are a very important part. We represent a 12.2% of the employment in Spain. 2.2 million people directly or indirectly depend from the tourism industry and 10.8% of GDP depending on the years. So we're definitely a very, very relevant sector. But once again, we're not only drivers of fun mm, to Spain, we're not only service providers of good atmosphere and enjoyment. We have been an important catalyst for a number of industries to grow in service, in infrastructure, in technology, if that services uh, companies were not behind uh, that growth of tourism, tourism in Spain would not have grown at the path is down. So now we're able to be present internationally in many countries due to that fact and due to the technology and the experience we gain in our own market. Right, so, so Lisa, don't get me wrong, of course, I actually see the tourism industry as being very glamorous. Uh, <laughs> Uh, far more than uh, you know the high-tech uh, industry myself, but that's my own personal opinion. Uh, but I guess you just uh, were alluding at the end of your answer uh, to a very important fact, which is that uh, Spain is not only a, uh, a powerhouse in the global economy uh, in terms of attracting tourism, so meaning as an exporter of uh, services of tourism, but it's also a powerhouse, perhaps the, the, the largest uh, um, uh, source country for foreign investments in tourism, right? So Spanish companies uh, in the sector have, over the last uh, few years, made major investments around the world. Could you comment a little bit on that? Yes, well, it, the, the, the story of success in our internal market has built up powerful companies which are now investing and spreading and diversifying their activities abroad. And again, let me go one step backward. Uh, and that's not only hotels and travel agencies where I'll go that, uh, but first of all, as Carlos mentioned before, six out of the ten major operators of infrastructures around the world, airports, uh, highways, are Spanish companies. I mean, they definitely, most probably, learned a lot by the development in Spain, which was basic for the development of tourism. Uh, two very important Spanish companies are major airport operators around the world. Uh, two uh, major technology companies, Indra here, which already sold, but Amadeus, uh, are the major service providers. Amadeus is a company that transacts about 500 million uh, airline reservations per year around the world, working with 200 airlines and be present globally at whole levels. This is also part of the industry, not to say an arrive of major multinational in the hotel industry where we are present or they are present in almost 60 countries with direct investments uh, in this part of the world, in the Americas, they will be running and being partially a full owner of around 300 properties from 
uh, the U.S. all the way down to Argentina. That accounts for around 100,000 uh, employees. And basically, in most of those countries, Spain is the leader in the tourism industry, in the vacation side, in the leisure side, because we're quite positioned in that part of the industry. As much as in Spain, we reflect also very story of success in cities like Barcelona, where we could compete our, our different levels with the New York. Barcelona is a story of success. For Barcelona, tourism is one of the major sources of income, and therefore all this experience is being now transferred abroad. We have major multinationals, which we, not only we're happy to be working abroad, but we will be happy to be considered as partners for some foreign investors, not only in Spain, and not only where we are, as partners to be taken in consideration to make successful business with, and therefore Spanish multinationals in the hotel industry, only also in the distribution. Do you know that the third major worldwide company in online travel services after your Expedias and your Priceline is a Spanish company based in Barcelona, the Ageo. So we have a lot of experience that we would like to share. We would like to partner with American investors and worldwide investors wanting to share a story of success like the one we can provide to the world. Yeah, so before I ask, I ask you the last question, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, the uh, piece of information that you shared with us about the fact that uh, among the 10 largest infrastructure management companies in the world, there are six or seven, depending on the year, companies from Spain, among the largest in the world. And the data, for those of you who have never seen it, come from a company that is based here in New Jersey, and it's called Public Works Financing. So if you go to their website, you can download their rankings, and you can see that uh, six or seven every year of the top infrastructure management companies in the world happen to be from, from Spain. And the last question uh, about tourism. So we've talked about exports, and we've talked about uh, outward foreign investments. Uh, but there's also a very important uh, aspect of this, which is, well, we also welcome foreign investments coming into Spain. Uh, so for those in the room who are interested in that other aspect of the problem, uh, what do you think are the opportunities right now for investing uh, in Spain uh, related to the uh, tourism sector? Well, I think in Spain we're following the process of repositioning what is the traditional, more conventional tourism industry in the sense mass market, mass volumes in terms of trying to go into higher added value and repositioning not necessarily higher volumes of people but higher income. Having said that as a concept, that drives a lot of opportunities in reinvesting in new models of doing things. Technology has a lot of opportunities in driving a change of how do we manage tourism at home. So there are opportunities for foreign investors to come in. I wouldn't go and I try to deny there are distressed assets, uh, but I wouldn't put my attention only in that distressed assets in the tourism industry in the real estate is something that brought opens an opportunity, definitely does, but also the new investments, as Carlos also mentioned, very relevant ones like Las Vegas Sands, which proves that fresh money is coming into Spain <coughs> because they still look that the tourism industry will continue to be a main driver of the economy and a main source of good business to be done in my country. So we will be becoming any investors, and again, as I mentioned, any foreign investor and any American investor will be very welcome by a Spanish multinational companies doing business in, as again, Carlos mentioned, Latin America, where we're very, very strong, Northern Africa, and even the Far East, where we're growing and taking positionings in the leisure industry in the Far East also. Yes, I have noticed that uh, actually, uh, uh, for the first time, perhaps about two or three years ago, it was possible to visit the, most, the 20 most important cities in the world and stay at a hotel owned by a Spanish company. Mm -hmm. Something that five or 10 or 15 years ago was just uh, simply not possible. That's true. So last but not least, uh, we're going to go to the uh, construction uh, industry and uh, infrastructure more broadly. And we have here with us Christopher Ward, who is the uh, executive uh, vice president for major projects here in the United States for Atragados. And uh, prior to that, uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, referred to this uh, fact. Uh, he was the executive director of the uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which must be one of the biggest uh, infrastructure management companies in the U.S., correct? I think it's actually the biggest. It is the biggest, it right? It is the biggest. Yeah, far. everything in New York is the biggest, uh, <laughs> at least in the U.S., right? <laughs> so, uh, um, and uh, the first question here is, uh, is also, you know, relatively simple just to get us uh, started in the topic, uh, which is, um, where do you see, from the, you know, from the point of view of a company such as Dragados, uh, where are the interesting, the attractive uh, niches or projects or opportunities in the U.S. market? Um, well, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times that you take the 
incredible expertise and public commitment to transportation infrastructure in Spain. And then with the contraction of the economy there, companies like Trugados and a lot of our competition see the United States as a major, major market for expansion and diversification. Um, and Mayor Bloomberg, to his credit, um, has talked about one model, which is cities like New York, but the mature cities in the United States are 70, they're a lot younger than European cities, but their infrastructure is 70, 80 to 100 years old, and they all have to be rebuilt. So whether it's a subway system, which Dragados is currently building for the Long Island Railroad here in New York City to connect to Grand Central, or is it an expansion of the historic aqueduct tunnel system for water supply, New York, Boston, Maryland, San Francisco, Chicago, all those cities have major infrastructure projects just to keep pace with their current economies are going to have to be upgraded. Um, but you can also look at other transportation infrastructure, which was mentioned. I was the executive director of the Port Authority and made news one day um, that LaGuardia Airport is without a doubt the crappiest airport in, in probably the entire United States and I won't say the world having not seen all of them, but clearly that airport needs to be torn down and rebuilt again. Um, it's no longer a modern transit hub for a city like New York City and companies like Dragados doing the civil infrastructure, but working with obviously our sister company, Hoctif, and other Spanish companies and looking at aviation transportation is also great. The other statistic that was brought up is that cities in the United States are growing in areas that they never used to grow before. You've seen in Texas that 40% of the rural population has moved into cities. And with that comes congestion, comes transportation problems, comes the question of the application of technology. So Dragados is now competing um, throughout the United States and building new roads, new highways, often bringing technology, and perhaps most importantly, bringing the opportunity of um, capital investment from Europe, from Spain, and with our partners at ACS, building the whole public-private partnership model, which has been so robust in Europe, but really has not been as strong as we would like here in the United States. So we see the diversification when Spain is contracting a major, major market here for public infrastructure, the Dragados, and as was mentioned, four or five other major Spanish infrastructure companies are competing for it. Yeah, so you've uh, already alluded to a couple of other things mm -hmm. that I want to ask you about. Uh, the first is, uh, so fine, Dragados is a company with a lot of experience in Spain, Latin America, other countries. What does it bring to the table here uh, to the United States? What are the uh, unique capabilities that Dragados has to offer uh, that essentially makes it a uh, formidable competitor in this infrastructure market? What is unique about Dragados? Me, no. Um, uh, <laughs> as the only American in the panel. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the incredible thing to say the American arrogance of technology and innovation has blinded us in many ways to European countries which have far outpaced us in terms of the application of new technologies, creativity in the application of technologies. So the whole, Regatos right now is the premier company in tunnel boring machine and tunnel capacity. Um, and if you look at cities constrained by the growth that they have, tunneling for transportation solutions is clearly a major uh, challenge and opportunity. And that's a technology that we learned and developed in Spain that we've now brought to the United States. So for example, we are about to launch the largest tunnel boring machine ever fabricated, fabricated in Japan, brought over from Japan to Seattle, where we will be tearing down an old elevated highway, again, out of the 1940s and 1950s, and taking that Spanish technology of tunnel boring, building a new highway system literally under the waterfront of Seattle. Um, and that 57-foot diameter tunnel boring machine is just a, another example of kind of the technology and the innovation that came out of the European commitment and very, very much a Spanish commitment to public infrastructure. I yeah. mean, if you look at the, uh, the Madrid highway system and the whole introduction and transformation of Madrid from the ring road, going from a ring road to a submerged and in some case tunnel system, completely opened up that southern part of Madrid and we think that same kind of innovation and economic development will happen in Seattle. Yeah, and you know that point that he's referring to the M30, right, and the, uh, the uh, bringing it underneath uh, that part of Madrid. 
I mean, it is, I think, important to note that the big dig in Boston was more or less of the same scale and complexity. However, the big dig in Boston took like four times as many years to complete. The cost overruns were about five or six or seven times greater than those at the M30 right in Madrid. Uh, and uh, we frequently you know, don't realize that we actually have the best uh, companies in the world when it comes to you know, developing these uh, infrastructures in an urban setting. Uh, so if you compare the uh, process by which Madrid built the, uh, the, did the soterramiento right, of the M30 uh, compared to uh, the big dig in Boston, there's no comparison. Right? I mean, we are far better at, uh, at doing those things. No, I mean, the facts, the facts speak for themselves. Uh, and the I last time... I always love facts. They always speak right. for themselves, but it depends no, but... on who's speaking. <laughs> <laughs> no. But again, uh, five times uh, the, uh, the, uh, the time that it took to complete and uh, six or seven times the cost overrun. But anyway, the last uh, thing uh, that I would like to ask you, uh, Christopher, is... Uh, you alluded earlier to the importance of uh, private-public uh, partnerships and how that can be a vehicle uh, for uh, implementing uh, some of these uh, larger-scale infrastructure projects. And you mentioned that Spanish companies and, in general, European companies have a lot of experience doing that. So what is Dragados planning to do in order to deploy that kind of a uh, operating mode here in the United States, where it is, as you mentioned, not as frequent? Um, well, I think, the, the <clears throat> strangely, the market opportunity for ACS and Dragados is a, somewhat of a function of that the federal government here in the United States, I think unwisely, is contracting and is moving away from building public infrastructure. The transportation funding from Washington is getting smaller and smaller in cities like New York or states like Texas, states like Maryland, Florida, for example, where they have major, major infrastructure needs but need to access private capital. And what ACS brings with a partnership with Dragados is that ability to provide long-term patient capital to build infrastructure that otherwise wouldn't get built. I think you don't compete with projects that have previously been built. You build and compete on projects that are not getting financed and can't get built. So in Miami, north of Miami, ACS and Dragados are building a high-speed toll road, relieving the congestion on 595, which is creating an economic challenge for the tourism industry in southern Miami. Similarly, you look at states like North Carolina <coughs> where they have contracted on their public investment and are looking more and more towards the private sector investment. The challenge in the United States is, unfortunately, we're 50 different states. Um, and each with one of those 50 states comes a different business model for how you deploy private capital. Canada, on the other hand, although there are 13 provinces, is, are much more consistent in terms of how they do public-private partnerships. So ACS and Dragados and our partners up to the north have won five out of the six major, major public-private partnerships in Canada. We just hope a little more discipline comes to the local markets here in the United States and you begin to see, again, as every economist has mentioned today, that interplay of investment infrastructure that links us globally. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the floor for questions and answers in a second. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to clarify one thing, which is that ACS is the parent company Correct. of Dragados, right? Just uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the Spanish uh, construction uh, industry. And the second is that, uh, you know, I want to go back to uh, the uh, comment that I made at the beginning about uh, stereotypes and cliches. And I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this panel will dispel uh, or dissipate most of those, uh, you know, thoughts. But a couple of years ago, I was on CNBC on a show uh, that uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, called Mad Money. So I was an invited, uh, uh, invited to uh, talk about the Spanish financial sector. And much to my dismay, when I went there, Jim Kramer, who's the host of the, uh, of the show, maybe you're familiar with him, he actually came in dressed as a bullfighter, right? <laughs> and uh, I could not believe, you know, uh, that I was, uh, you know, seeing in front of my eyes uh, what I was seeing there. And uh, luckily, of course, uh, that stereotype about the bull, as you know, has the connotation in this country that things are going well, right? As opposed to, uh, so I guess Russia, uh, because it's a bear, has a, uh, <laughs> has a problem, but not us. But anyway, I hope that uh, so far this panel has helped, uh, uh, once again, dissipate or minimize some of those uh, stereotypes uh, that I think a lot of people still have about uh, the Spanish economy and more specifically about Spanish companies. So at this point, I would like to open it up to uh, questions uh, from the audience. And please identify yourselves, uh, and uh, we have a question over there. And use a microphone if possible so that everyone can uh, hear the question. I don't need a microphone. OK, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Sharon Mayer, and I own a company here in New York called Spoken Enterprises. Um, I am a certified woman-owned business, and I represent 11,000 certified women-owned business here in the United States. My question to you, uh, gentlemen, goes the following. Uh, we influence a lot of the 
spend here in the U.S., as well as abroad, that being we, the women, uh, we are looking for opportunities and frontiers to expand our business to grow. What does Spain have to offer my 11,000 eager women to come and start their new businesses? I'm not touching that one. Puede ofrecer para que puedan hacer productos que puedan vender aquí. No, no, no. No, I'm just trying to decide who will answer the question. They couldn't hear you well. No, no. Let me repeat the question. The question. Uh, can people hear me at the back of the room? Yeah. Okay. So the question is. Uh, so you represent an association, right, of uh, women-led businesses here in the United States. And your question is, what is it that Spanish companies can do, right, to appeal to the uh, women consumer market in the U.S.? And I guess also vice versa is what can these businesses do in Spain, right? Well, it's not just about the con consumer portion that we bring to the table. It's about the growth and development and the partnership that we're looking to do to expand our business as well. Okay. I know we all like to go shopping, and that is not a fictitious you know, idea about women, but we also like to make money, and we like to work with smart yeah. businessmen. So, so opportunities in Spain as well for these businesses. Who would like to take on that question? I would like to answer from a tourism point of view. There is no discrimination. Any good proposal you have to bring to us, we will be more than ready to look at it, to consider it, and very happy if we can conclude a business with. Yeah, uh, I was going to say something similar. In, in Spain, uh, of course, uh, the role of women has dramatically changed in the last uh, 30 years. And women today, well, in fact, we have to protect ourselves, men, <laughs> at this moment, to keep a, a, a part of the cake. Uh, you know? uh, women are, are getting uh, the, the bigger uh, part of the cake. Uh, but uh, what we have found in terms of, of management, basically in Spain, is that women have uh, uh, increased the, uh, uh, in a number of areas in which we we, we men are not so, so good. Uh, for instance, in marketing, nowadays in Spain, you find uh, two-thirds of the, of the leading uh, uh, marketing people are women uh, because they are uh, better uh, to know what, uh, how to attract uh, people, how to attract consumers, how to sell your products and things of that kind. More and more, we see women coming to management positions. Uh, uh, we are still below some Scandinavian countries in which the percentage of women in, in boards are over 50 percent. We, we still to protect and defend ourselves and it's about 20 percent in Spain. But uh, there are no restrictions uh, to women uh, business. Uh, we have more and more women associations uh, in business to, who would be ready to partner with a similar association in the U.S. And um, I don't have any specific recipe to say uh, there is this uh, market opportunity. I think it's the same as men. And this is a lot to say in a country in which uh, some ideas of machism uh, and things uh, could be part of the cliche. So two other panelists uh, will actually like to jump in. Uh, no, so Juan Gonzalez from Indra. Yes, when, uh, if you take a look at the uh, uh, program, my name should not be there. The name there should be Emma Fernandez, uh, who is my boss. And I came here only because she could not make it, because she had a, uh, a personal problem yesterday night. So I had to, to jump on the plane to, to come to substitute for her. I, I don't see uh, an issue at all. Uh, yeah, Arturo? We're facing a very difficult situation in Spain. And we think that the, the solution for the crisis is talent. And talent has to come from where it is. And of course, diversity is a critical aspect in our business, and we think that women have a protagonistic role to play. But if you want to see some figures, this is a worry in many European companies, how to make uh, the, the talent of women come to the management and top management of companies. And there is a European association which is called ERT, European Roundtable of Industrialists, and we are running a project in which we inform transparently on what's the percentage of women in our management and top management positions, and what are we doing to really create a fair playing field for women in, in large companies. 
I really invite you to have a look at that web page because we think it's, it's something uh, very important. I think we are wasting a lot of talent for not giving women the opportunities to exploit that, that talent in our organizations. Okay, let's get a second question from the audience. <coughs> questions we convince everybody to well, exactly <laughs> and please identify yourself jose castello banco santander eh, carlos una pregunta para ti qué medidas estás tomando para incentivar y desarrollar la marca españa alrededor del mundo so, so the question is uh, what uh, uh, measures uh, or what programs uh, is the high commissioner uh, putting into place to promote uh, brand spain around the world well, uh, Brand of Spain is a project in which uh, we partner with the private sector. So it's not only the public sector, but also the private who has to build up and try to improve this image uh, uh, of Spain abroad. Of course, the image uh, of Spain, the perception of Spain is different in one area from another in the world. It's not the same what the French people think about Spain or what is the image of Spain in Argentina, in China, or in the US. So what we have done is to identify 15 markets to which we give a priority. Of course, uh, US is one of them. Try to, first of all, analyze what is the present, the actual situation of uh, the image of Spain. Then try to see where do we want to go and the measures uh, that we will employ to move from A to to be. Um, concerning uh, uh, the situation, uh, or the present situation uh, uh, of Spain, is the image of a country which is uh, nice to uh, most of the people, to which we, uh, most of people do not recognize a high-tech uh, possibility. This is one of the things we want to do. We want to, to move our image from a traditional market uh, traditional country to a modern one. We try to, uh, to participate in, in things that uh, will help uh, uh, us in that way. Uh, for instance, uh, I was last week in Florida where they celebrate the 500th anniversary of the discovery of Florida by Spaniards. And we try to emphasize uh, how this uh, country, Spain, has uh, helped to create uh, this uh, wonderful country, which is U.S., founding the first settlements, the first roads, uh, both in Southwest uh, America and all the West Coast, and how 500 years later, the Spanish companies like uh, Dragados, Repsol, and others are helping to build up uh, uh, this country again, and in which we have architects uh, uh, that have been built, building uh, uh, buildings in, uh, in New York or Chicago, or the LA Cathedral, or they are doing uh, all this infrastructure work we're doing. So we try to, to call the attention of people and saying, yes, Spain is a country full of history, of culture, of tradition, but at the same time, today is part of the modern community in the world, and we have something uh, to offer. This is uh, one example I could uh, tell many, many things we try to do, but our main purpose is try to bring up to date the, the reality of what the Spain and the Spanish companies and the Spanish culture can offer worldwide. Thank you. We have a question here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is actually... Could you identify yourself? Oh, yes, please. Um, uh, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel Torres from Fundación CESEP for the Center for Higher Virtual Learning. Um, actually, we, we are in a round table. Uh, two roundtables after this one. So it's very much related, I, I think. My question was also for, uh, is actually also for, for Carlos, but uh, also for, for everybody in the roundtable. Um, uh, do you feel that in the current situation, the private sector is actually following your lead in terms of uh, promoting the Spain uh, brand or the, the, the image of Spain as a, as a good country to go to and invest in and create um, new companies? Um, do you, do you find the situation in other countries comparable to the situation in Spain in terms of support or uh, not so much support um, to, to this national strategy? Um, do, do American companies promote themselves as American or um, 
I believe uh, 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 you know the, the things that the, the, the Council for Competitiveness in Spain is doing right now with the top executives uh, doing road shows to promote the, the image of Spain. Uh, what do you think of all these? Uh, uh, are these consequences? Are these orchestrated national strategies? Thank you. <coughs> well, of course, one of the first things we did was uh, when this uh, full program started last July was try to find out what other countries uh, have been doing uh, with success, trying to look for, uh, for benchmark, uh, trying to learn from, from other countries' lessons. And what we have seen <coughs> at the very beginning is that uh, uh, this partnership is, is basic. If we want to promote uh, a country, we need uh, the efforts of everybody, local, regional, national level, private, public, and so on. And we have built up uh, a relationship. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy of the support I get uh, from the private sector. Uh, really, uh, those who, who build up the image of a country are the companies, are the, uh, the individuals, are the, uh, the people in, in culture, which uh, you can find them. Uh, and it's not the government. I don't believe in government as uh, as uh, an active uh, engine. The most uh, I give to the government is the possibility of coordinating some of these activities. But the activities have to come from the private sector and they are coming and I think uh, I, I, I can be very happy if I look uh, around what other countries get. Yes, please. If I may, just a minute. I think we have here a very interesting situation because we are Spanish companies operating in many places and we absolutely support the efforts of the Spanish government to promote the branch of Spain. And we are involved in the Consejo Empresarial para la Competitividad, et cetera. But at the same time, we have to be global companies and that means also being local in those places in which we are working. For instance, here we have to be Spanish companies, but we have to be also good US corporate citizens. And we have to be seen as both, as Spanish companies and as U.S. companies at the same time. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. Okay, people, I guess, are... Uh, they're convinced. Uh, they're convinced, yes. <laughs> uh, we, we have been very effective, and you would like to have coffee. So let me just uh, end this panel by uh, first uh, mentioning that, uh, you know, we've seen here uh, just uh, four you know, uh, experiences uh, from four different industries represented here, you know, oil, high tech, oil, uh, construction and tourism. Uh, but if we went down the uh, classification of uh, industries in Spain, uh, you know, there's more than uh, uh, 50 uh, two digit uh, industries in Spain. Uh, uh, and uh, we would find examples of companies such as the ones uh, that we featured here on this panel. Uh, so this is not a, uh, it is a representative sample, but it's not the population. This is just a very small sample. Uh, of uh, what uh, Spanish companies have to offer uh, right now in the United States and uh, in the global economy more generally. And I would also like to uh, you know, acknowledge uh, once again that uh, we have here uh, Carlos, uh, who is making this uh, effort uh, to, as he just mentioned, coordinate uh, the uh, global projection uh, in terms of the image of Spain and of its companies. And I think that is a uh, very valuable asset uh, that we have. And uh, of course, we have the best possible person uh, for the job. Uh, okay. uh, and I would also like to end the uh, panel by thanking once again the organizers and for thanking all of you for your attention. And I guess uh, the next uh, thing on the program is that we have some coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.